probably noticed a theme in our commercials before our service starts connecting with a life group so good morning shoreline vineyard church it is good to be with you all this morning it's a bit of a rainy day out there and so it is nice to be safe and dry inside and uh you know thank you all of you who have made an effort to be online with us this morning special welcome to any guests who have joined us here and uh, my name is Chris Sybertson. I am blessed to be the lead pastor for Shoreline Vineyard Church in Guilford, Connecticut. And uh, this morning's background is one of my favorite backgrounds because it means that next week we're going to be down at the beach together. And uh, I am excited about that. I am excited about seeing everybody again. I am excited about getting a couple of hugs. May 1st, the governor has lifted the mask mandate for outdoor get-togethers and we're meeting on May 2nd so that means we can actually meet together without masks now I think they still want us to safely distance from each other they, they don't really want us all over each other but um, at least we'll be able to see your smiling face so I am really looking forward to that I will have a big smile on myself and uh, for those of you who are also vaccinated I will be receiving hugs and giving hugs so for anybody who is willing and wanting to do that so um, I'm excited. So that's going to be May 2nd down at the beach. It's going to be really, really great. And uh, other than that, I've got a really good topic to talk about this morning. Brian's going to be in with announcements, but guess what? Brian is actually also here. Stick your head in here. Brian's here with me this morning in the studio. And uh, that's because at the end of May, I'm going to be taking some time off for Tanya and I to go uh, away for our uh, anniversary. And I am looking forward to finally getting away and uh, getting on a real vacation. So that's going to be great. And Brian is going to be here kind of uh, running the online portion of the service. So he's learning what to do and how to do it. And uh, so that's why he's kind of poking his head in every now and then. So uh, he will be in with his usual announcements. He wasn't bold enough to go ahead and talk live yet. So I've got his announcement file. So he's got on a, a funny shirt and a funny hat in typical Brian fashion. And uh, as we've all come to love. So um, we're going to kick off. I've got some worship for you. And then I've got a really great message that's uh, going to come from Christ's time on the cross, and uh, I think it's going to be a really liberating message this morning. So uh, would you join with me in prayer as we open? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God, for this day. Lord, I thank you for this assembling of your people, Father, and just that the church can still get together, that nothing stops your church. And so, Lord, I just uh, pray for this morning now, Lord, that you just be with us, that the church would uh, just be getting together and doing what you want us to do, that we're sowing into each other's lives and that we're learning about your word and that we're sharing your message, Lord. And so, Father, I pray that you just be with us this morning now and that you bless this time and may your Holy Spirit move among us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's take a few minutes to sing to our King. I encourage you to sing along. The words will be on the screen. So praise is the prescription for peace. Let's go ahead and sing to our King now. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray.
Good morning, Shoreline Vineyard Church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this chance to gather, uh, whether it be in our families, whether it be uh, in a smash group, uh, whether it be by ourselves corporately. Father, we ask that you unite our hearts, that you would teach us, that you would indeed conform us to the image of your Son, in whose name we pray. Again, good morning, uh, Shoreline Vineyard Church. A special welcome to visitors and people uh, that are with us for the first time. It's great to have you with us once again for Virch. Um, a uh, couple announcements. If you'd like to continue to give to this ministry, you can do so here. And if you'd like to continue to help us support other ministries and outreaches and missions and the gospel and relief work around the world, here and around the world, you can do so here. As always, you can write to us at Shoreline Vineyard Church, P.O. Box 383, Guilford, Connecticut, 06437. You can reach our lead pastor, that is Chris Sybertson, at chris at shorelinevineyard.org. We've got a women's Monday night group, a uh, Zoom group that Eileen runs that's almost so large, it almost spills onto a second Zoom screen. I believe it's our largest uh, small group currently. And for details, talk to Eileen Kramer. That's Mondays at 7 o'clock. CMConsult at snet.net. Uh, there is a Freedom Zoom group that Mike and Mark are very faithful at doing. They've got a number of people that attend with them regularly. MJPFO at AOL.com. That's Tuesdays at 7.30. Dave and Amy are doing a book a week in the Bible, and this week they're going to be in the book of Proverbs. 
So if you want wisdom, you can join them, Dave and Amy Mueller. That is Amelia and David at yahoo.com. Naugahyde. Um, as well, we've got uh, a Zoom prayer and intercession. That's Thursdays at 6.30. That's MJPFO at AOL.com. So for details, talk to Mark. So it's very exciting. You might be wondering why am I wearing this uh, very uh, attractive shirt and hat. And that's a reminder to us that we're meeting next week in person at Jacob's Beach. And Jacob's Beach is located at 140 Seaside Avenue. Uh, you go to the south end of the... Guilford Green, you go straight, you go over the railroad tracks, and you take a right on Seaside Avenue, and you go to the end of that road, and you can't miss it. And uh, we're very grateful to Guilford Parks and Rec, who's let us reserve a pavilion there. Uh, our service will kick off at 10.30. Um, I have this. I think uh, you guys are familiar with the story of Moses ascending with the tablets and the law written on it. This is the law according to Rick Maynard. Rick Maynard is... Uh, our host at the community center, as well as all parks and recreation around Guilford. And he hand wrote with the finger of Rick Maynard on the back of my boogie board, the law as it relates to uh, the beach rules. So I like to go through these because we don't want to be breaking any of these rules. No smoking tobacco on the beach area, under the pavilions, or on the playground. So really the only place you can smoke is underground. No boats or flotation devices. This includes tubes rubber boats, swimmies, air mattresses, and personal flotation devices. All swimmers must stay in the swim area. Unnecessary rough play is not tolerated. No fishing in the beach area. No snorkels or scuba equipment in the swim area. Most importantly, all swimmers must wear swimsuits. You know who you are. No swimmers in long pants. Carry out all litter. No glass in the beach area or Naugahyde. Uh, adults have to closely supervise all children and wives. Please supervise your husbands. Uh, swimming is only allowed when the lifeguard's on duty. No dogs allowed on the beach without a leash. No golfing. And no one, no one may walk on the jetty or the rocks at Jacob's Beach. But Rick says uh, you're more than welcome to walk on the water if you're able to do that. So we'll see you next Sunday, 1030 in the morning at Jacob's Beach. Be there. Bye. Uh, thank you, Brian. I love the hat, love the shirt. Thank you for the reading of the law. And uh, I'm really looking forward to our getting together next week, finally. We're going to have Dave and Amy and Mark and Mike leading us in live worship. It's going to be great. It's going to be May 2nd, which will be one day after the governor's easing of some restrictions, like wearing a mask while we're outside together. So, you're still welcome to do so if you want, but it won't be necessary at next week's service. And for me, I am fully vaccinated now. I am beyond my two weeks. I will be accepting hugs from those who are ready to give them. And uh, I have so missed everyone. So this is going to be great. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So we're in this series called The Magnificent Seven. And what we're doing in this is we're looking at the last statements that Jesus makes from the cross before he dies and is resurrected. And like I've said, for any regular person, a person's last words of life are usually held with high regard. And so for someone with Je someone like Jesus, only the more so. So Jesus was on the cross for six hours. They nailed him to the cross at nine in the morning and by 3 p.m. he dies. And during those six hours on the cross, Jesus meant, made seven statements. Every one of them is able to have an effect and an impact on our lives when we understand them. Now, the first three statements were made in the first three hours of the cross, and they were made about others. And we've covered all three of those now. The first word was forgiveness. We looked at that in week one where Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And it's the word forgiveness, and it's all about lifting our guilt. Second week, we looked at the word of salvation or assurance, where the thief hanging next to Jesus said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' response is, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. We talked about what's the minimum you need to know in order to get into heaven. And if there was one statement that would rank most important, most critical for us to all understand and know, it would be that one. And then just last week, we looked at the word relationship, 
where Jesus speaks to his mother, Mary, and his best friend, John. And we saw how Jesus connected the two to preserve the family relationship that we uh, saw that we find all throughout the Bible, both in our natural lives as well as in our church family also. And so now we're going to come to the fourth word. And really, this is one that kind of boils down for us, the ugly truth of sin and what happens as a result of it on the cross. And Scholars have boiled this statement down to the word abandonment. Abandonment. It's the fourth word of Christ from the cross. But I hope to show you this morning, I hope we're going to be able to see that there's a much better word to describe what happened in this moment. So before we get into it, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning, Lord God. I thank you for this assembling of your body. Lord, I thank you for your word, that it's so full of meaning and life, Lord God, that we can learn things. We're 40, 50, 60 years into a relationship with you, Lord, and you're still teaching us things. So, Lord, I thank you for that, Father. I pray that this morning your word would come alive. I pray that we would know the truth of your word, Lord God, and that we would... um, be able to strip away anything that we've added to it that doesn't belong. So, Father, I just give you this morning now. I give you this time, Lord. I pray that your uh, word would pierce each heart that's listening to it now. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we find this morning's statement in Matthew 27, where we find that around noon, everything starts to get dark. I mean, it's been pretty dark out this morning with all the rain and You know, but we get the feeling like this was somehow more than just, you know, kind of dark shadows with the rain, that God did something at this time. And, you know, the time between noon and three are typically the brightest hours of the day. But we're going to see here that God brought in a covering of darkness for the final three hours of Jesus's suffering on the cross. So let's look at this morning's statement. Comes from Matthew 27. It says, at noon... Darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice. And now you've no doubt read this statement or heard this statement read many times. And we kind of think of this moment here that because Jesus is weak and in pain, that he kind of just utters this phrase, that he just kind of says it. But he says here, it says, says it in a loud voice. A loud voice is the fourth word from the cross, and it's an agonizing word from the cross. And Jesus screams out at the top of his lungs, and he says, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the other translation reads like this. It says, my God, my God, why have you left me? My God, my God, why have you deserted me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you left me alone? The fourth word of Jesus from the cross is the word abandoned. And it's a shocking word. It's a painful word. And I want you to bear with me a little bit here. You know, this is a painful word. Abandoned. Why have you abandoned me? Why have you deserted me? Why have you let go of me? Why have you forsaken me? We've read this verse so many times. And abandonment is something that's painful. It hurts. It hurts deep. It hurts to your core. When a spouse abandons, when a parent abandons, when a child or sibling abandons a family. You know, I think of those kids that we saw a few weeks ago being dropped over the border wall from Mexico. Just dropped over and you see these guys just run off. They were abandoned. And Jesus here has been progressively abandoned by everybody. His brothers and sisters bailed on him long ago. One of his inner team, Judas, betrays him and abandons him. Peter bails on his relationship with Jesus when he denies him three times that very morning. The rest of the disciples all bailed on him for fear of being arrested. John and the Marys are the only ones left with him. And then at this point, Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. Which most of the translations seem to translate for us as, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And this is what I want to talk about this morning, because there's so much more going on in this verse than you may have known simply by just reading it. And some of Jesus' last words, 
This is a really popular verse. Most of us know this verse, whether we can quote the chapter and verse or not. We don't usually know the, you know, the literal words that Jesus spoke. Most people don't say that, but we are very familiar with, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And as I read them preparing for this passion, I had a question pop into my mind. Now, what you have to remember is, again, that the Bibles we read in English today were not written in English. Matthew didn't write this scripture in English for us. All of the Bible has been translated from an original text, which is written in either Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. And from these translations, we get all the different translations from the Bible, of the Bible. We've got a bunch of literal translations, like it looks at the Greek, it looks at the Hebrew, it looks at the Aramaic, and it literally translates. This is exactly what these words translate to English as. These are books like the King James Version and the New American Standard Version. There's several others. And then we have thought for thought translations. These are versions like the NIV. It's like, okay, I'm reading this and let me tell you what it says because I can understand the Greek and, and this is what it means in English. And then we have kind of even looser translations called free translations, which try to even further connect our vocabulary and the vernacular that we use to the original text. The message is one of the more popular ones. And in almost all of our English Bibles, we see this passage with Christ's words as he spoke them. They aren't interpreted into English. And then the next verse comes in to tell us what it means in our native tongue. Why? Why? Why do we get not translated this Eli, Eli, Lema, Sabachthani? Why is that not translated for us? Why do we get that in Jesus' original tongue? What's the importance of that? Well, I believe it's because there's actually two different things being said here. Not one thing being said two different ways. And if I can lay this out for you clearly, I think you're really going to appreciate what's happening here in a way you may not have ever seen it before. I think so many of our translations have missed it. And I think that it's overflowed into our thinking in a very incorrect way. So bear with me, please. Let's look at this phrase that Jesus says. The phrase is regularly being mentioned as being in Aramaic, but that's really only partly true. It's actually a combination of Hebrew and Aramaic. Eli, Eli, Lima is Hebrew. It means El of me. El is God. So we have God of me or my God. Lema means why? So this part of the phrase is literally translated, my God, my God, why? Well, I'm going to have a problem with that. It's this next word. The last word, sabachthani, is an Aramaic word. And this word translates as sacrificed, not abandoned. And so a proper translation of Jesus' phrase is actually, my God, my God, why have you sacrificed me? Now, again, bear with me as I try to expand on this. Aramaic and Hebrew are very similar languages. Similar, but not the same. Both are spoken in Jesus' time, but under different circumstances. Hebrew was the language of scholars and of the scriptures. Aramaic was the natural spoken language of the culture. <coughs> and scholars pretty much all agree that Jesus' everyday spoken language was Aramaic. And that this is the language he spoke and taught in. However, Jesus, being Jesus, would of course need to be fluent in Hebrew as well in order to connect and to teach from the scriptures that the scholars used. It's very much in the way like the Catholic Church scholars would read and expose in Latin, but in conversation and in teaching people would speak in the native tongue, in our case, English. So what's going on here? And why does it seem like Matthew is telling us that Jesus cried that he was abandoned, that he's been left alone? You know, why is Jesus using both Hebrew and Aramaic? We've got two books to our Bible, two testimonies, two covenants. The word testament means testimony. These books are accounts. They're reports of something that happened. 
We've got the Old Testament. This is the testimony of the first things that God did. It's a testimony of his first covenants with us. And then we have a New Testament, a testimony or an account of God, things that God did after the first covenant. It's a testimony of his new covenant or new agreement with us. And the expression you've heard me use time and again is the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. We're under a new covenant. We're under the agreement that was made with Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. But like I alluded to last week, just because we have a new deal with God, it doesn't make everything we've learned under the old deal useless. So much of the New Testament reaches back into the Old Testament. Why? Because God doesn't change. God doesn't change, and it's not a different story. It's one long story. The same God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament, with all the same attributes, personality, and characteristics. It's the same God, just with a new way of interacting with him, a better way, full of grace. And what this means is that a lot of time we can't explain the new relationship without drawing from the first one especially when the first one does so much prophesying about the new one. The Old Testament is loaded with prophecy about a coming Messiah, what he'll be like, what he will encounter, what he will do, what will happen to him. There are anywhere from 44 to over 350 Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfills about being the Messiah. So like I said, so much of what we see in the New Testament reaches back into the Old Testament to show how things are being fulfilled. The book of Hebrews does this the most because it's an entire teaching devoted to explaining who Jesus is, how he's not just a prophet, how he fulfills the prophecies of the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. There's no other book in the Bible that connects the Old and New Testament like Hebrews. All right, well, that's really interesting, Chris, but what does that have to do with what we're talking about this morning? Well, like I said, there's a bunch of prophecies about Jesus, our Messiah, in the Old Testament, and one of them comes from Psalm 22. Now, let me just put a few verses from Psalm 22 up, and you let me know if anything seems familiar with the account of Jesus' crucifixion. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away? I'm scorned and despised by all. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads, saying, Is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Verse 14. My life is poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. They have pierced my hands and my feet. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. I mean, at this time, crucifixion didn't even exist. His righteous acts will be told but to those who are not yet born. They will hear about everything he's done. And if you look at your Bible at this morning's verse, you will most likely find a footnote or a star or a letter referencing you to Psalm 22, verse 1, which is, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And that verse is translated, Abandon me. So what am I telling you? That Matthew mistranslates Jesus' phrase from, Why have you sacrificed me? to, Why have you abandoned me? And the answer to that is that if you read Matthew's words, which mean, the words which mean, to be a translation, then yes, it's wrong. But the truth is that it's the interpretation of the Greek translators that translate the scripture to English, that's where it's wrong. The original Greek doesn't say that. The original Greek does not give Matthew's words to express a definition. It doesn't say which means. Those words, which means it, it's not a defining term. The literal translation of Matthew's words is, this is. It's not, this, it's not which means, it's this is. 
and several of the literal translations do it this way, which makes for a very much different statement. In fact, I'll show you one of the more literal translations like the King James. It does exactly this. Eli, Eli, Lema, Sabachthani. This is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Not a def definition of it. You know, when we look at the verse now, it becomes what I believe it is intended to be. A reference, a reference back to a prophecy being fulfilled by Jesus. Matthew is reaching back into the Old Testament saying, remember what David prophes prophesied? Remember, this is that moment. This is that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me moment. And now this makes so much more sense. It totally expa explains why Matthew includes Jesus' comments as quoted, but also what seems like an interpretation of those comments, but isn't. I mean, if Matthew's just writing like the rest of his gospel, why doesn't he just skip the Hebrew Aramaic quote? Why doesn't he just say, you know, and, you know, Jesus yelled out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He doesn't say that. He says what Jesus said, and then he ties it to the Psalm 22 scripture. And I think that's really too bad because I think we miss some of the richness of what happens in that moment. And I think it leads us to go down a very wrong path. Am I saying that God didn't turn his back on Jesus at that moment when all of the sin of the world was deposited on him? I'm not really saying anything. I'm letting the scripture say it. And when we let the scripture speak, then I believe what it's saying is happening here is not that God abandoned Jesus, but that he sacrificed him. And that it completes a connection back to the prophecy that was given in Psalm 22. All of the translations seem to have in common the connection to Psalm 22 with a footnote or an asterisk. You're not really going to find this verse without that connection. And that's important because that's what it's about. It's about that connection. Now I showed you several verses from Psalm 22 that make the connection and say, look, this is what our Messiah endures. There's one verse I left out though, and it's verse 22, 24 of Psalm 22. And it says this, this is all part of that same prophecy. And it says this, he has not despised my cries of deep despair. He has not turned and walked away. When I cried to him, he heard and he came. So, in fact, the prophecy that's quoted here explicitly says that God does not turn his back during his despair. I, I, this is awesome news. You know, does this affect any of your salvation? No. None of this matters to that. <laughs> if you believe Jesus died for your sin and is the way to the Father, you are all set. None of this matters. So why bring it up? Well, while it doesn't matter to your salvation, I think it does matter when we try to understand how God handles sin and what his nature is, what his character is. And for me, it's very much out of the character of God for him to abandon anyone. And believing that makes a place for a gap to be created between us and him. If you've been in the church for any time, you've heard it taught, no doubt, that God cannot even look at sin. He's so holy and sin isn't, so he can't even bear the sight of it. He just has to look away. And this is one of the verses that's used to support that idea, that Christ had so much sin on him that God couldn't bear to look at it, so he turns his back and he abandons Jesus while he dies on the cross. That's it. It's so out of his nature. And I think this confuses Christ's followers because we can take that to mean sometimes that, well, maybe when I'm sinning or when I have sin on me, that God can't look at me either. He turns away from me. I mean, that's kind of what this verse is saying. He had sin on him, so God couldn't look at him. Well, I've got sin on me. How could God look at me? I, I simply cannot find anything in Scripture to support that. Now, there's two verses in the Bible that are used to support this idea that God can't even look at sin. One is the one that we first re just read, 
which we kind of can see that Jesus didn't say that God abandoned him. Jesus said that, why did you sacrifice me? And then there's one more that comes from Habakkuk. And it's verse 13 of the first chapter. In the NIV, it says this. It says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot even tolerate wrongdoing. You can't tolerate wrongdoing. So you take this version of this verse and you take the version of the verse from Matthew that says God abandoned Jesus. And you wind up with a teaching that says God can't look upon sin. And that gets extrapolated out into everything else that gives God an excuse to keep his distance from sin. And if God is keeping his distance, then maybe that explains why he feels so far away from me and I feel disconnected from a God who says all he wants to do is be close to me. It's confusing. And I'll tell you, when we're confused, that's where the devil can insert some lies. So let me give you this same verse from Habakkuk in a few different translations. How about these? Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look favorably upon wickedness. We are wicked, but they far more. Will you, who cannot allow sin in any form, stand idly by while they swallow us up? You can't stand sin or wrong. You can't condone evil. So why do you do, do something about this? Why are you silent? But you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. Those verses are saying something quite a bit different than that God simply cannot be in the presence of sin. He can't look at it. I mean, if God could not look at sin, then he would never have been able to see his people suffering. If God can only look at us sinful people because we have the blood of Jesus upon us, then how could he ever look upon the nation of Israel that didn't have the blood of Jesus? Even that last verse, which I think is capturing the meaning of the NIV translation, says that God can't stand the sight of sin. And that makes sense. I can't stand the sight of starving children. That doesn't mean I can't look at it. I can't stand the sight of that horrible accident on the road, but it doesn't mean I don't look at it. I can't stand the sight of most politicians, to be quite honest, but I still watch the news. Again, very interesting, Chris, but where are you going with this? Where I'm going with this is here. God never abandoned anyone. Ever. He didn't abandon Christ on the cross. He didn't abandon you and your sin. When you fall into that thing that has a hold of you, God hasn't turned away from you. He hasn't turned away from your loved one who doesn't know Jesus yet. God hasn't turned his face away from our nation. We're still going to reap what we sow, but God hasn't abandoned us. God just simply is not in the cut and run business. It's not in his nature now. It has not been in his nature. God doesn't abandon Look throughout scripture and you will see it's not him who struggles to see us through our sin. It's the sinner who struggles to see him. When Adam and Eve sinned, who turned their back on who? Right? It was Adam and Eve that sewed aprons of fig leaves and then proceeded to hide themselves from the presence of God. They turned their back on God as a result of their sin. It's the sinner that can't bear to look on the holiness of God. In Isaiah 6, when Isaiah gets a glimpse of, the Lord, glimpse of the Lord on his throne, it's Isaiah that buries himself in shame. And then what happens? God comes and lifts his head, touches his lips with the coal, and imparted forgiveness. I don't know how he did that without being able to look at the sinner. Moses, in all of his weakness and sinfulness, the Lord spoke directly to him. How did he do this without looking at him? When God decides to reveal himself to Moses... Is it God that hides in the cleft of the rock? No. The Lord puts Moses there to protect Moses. Samson's father thought he was going to die when he saw the Lord. What about Daniel? What about Ezekiel? Yeah, God definitely can't stand to look at sin, but he never stops looking at us. And he doesn't abandon. Now, there will be one day where he will turn his back. And he tells us about this. He's warning us. He's prophesying about it. Everything in scripture is leading up to that time. 
He's going to turn his back on those who turn their back on him. That will be a day of judgment. Until that day, he stands there waiting to embrace us, looking at us. Not even waiting. He's chasing us down. Look at Adam and Eve. What is God's response to their sin? Does he hide himself from Adam and Eve? Does he turn his back on them? No. He came looking for them. He doesn't turn his back. He came seeking. This is the beginning of the story of redemption for all of us, a story that culminates with the Son of God coming in human flesh to seek and save each one of us. If God is a God that's unable to even bear the sight of sin, then Adam and Eve would have been abandoned a long time before Jesus ever got on the scene. But instead, God comes down from heaven into this sinful people, into this cesspool of sin to chase after us and to save us. God went looking for Adam and Eve. He was looking for me. He's looking for you. He's pursuing you. Even if you've abandoned him, he has never abandoned you. I mean, this is good news, right? I mean, it's not just me that's excited about this, I hope. Let me give you another reason why God didn't abandon Jesus and he doesn't abandon you. Because if that was the case, then it would be hatred that moves God. And my Bible is pretty clear that God is love. And everything he does is motivated out of his immense and immeasurable love for us. What am I talking about? Well, one of the bedrocks of our salvation and the measures of God's love for us is John 3.16. Now, let me tell you what John 3.16 doesn't say. It doesn't say that God hated sin so much that he gave his only son. No, it says that God so loved us so much that he gave his only son. God is not motivated by what he hates. He's motivated by love, love for us. So what's this moment on the cross teaching us? I mean, if the word is an abandonment, then what is it? Well, I think the better word is atonement. God didn't abandon Jesus. God made Jesus the sacrifice. My God, my God, why have you sacrificed me? God sacrificed Jesus to atone or to pay for the sins of the world. What's happening here isn't abandonment. It's atonement. The Bible says it like this in 1 John. It says, He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. He's saying Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of everybody. All the sins of the world were poured onto Jesus. Jesus says, I'm going to take them on myself and I'm going to die on the cross for everyone. Because I hate sin? No. Because I love them. What is atonement? Atonement's a great Christianese word. You really don't hear atonement in our culture. But it simply means making payment for damages done. If you crash into somebody's car and you have to pay to fix it, that's atonement. It's compensation for your crime. It's compensation for a sin or a wrong that you've done. It's payback time. It's satisfying the law, the first covenant. It's satisfying justice that when something's done wrong, that it just doesn't get ignored. And this is not unique to God. This is the law of man as well. You did the crime, you got to do the time. When something wrong is done, there must be a repayment, a retribution, a restitution, an atonement. It's what justice demands. It's the way our legal system works here and now. The Bible says Jesus is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. Not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. We talked about the mechanics of how God accomplishes this on the cross. It's the great exchange. It's 2 Corinthians 5. It says, God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. And then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. 
God takes all my junk, my pride, lust, lies, jealousy, all my unkind thoughts, every hurtful thing I've ever said or done. And he makes this great exchange. He takes all that stuff and pours it onto Jesus. He takes all that perfection of Jesus and pours it onto me. And now I am made perfect in God's eyes. That's what happened at this moment on the cross. It wasn't abandonment. It was atonement. So what do we do with that? How do we respond? I think we respond in three ways, and I'm going to wrap it up quick. The first thing is that I need to trust Jesus to take the fall for me. This is what the cross is all about. There's no other way that I'm going to get into heaven. I need to turn from my sin, and I need to trust Jesus to save me. The Bible says it like this in Romans 3. It says, God has shown us a different way to heaven, not by being good enough, and trying to keep his law, but by a new way, as the scriptures told us about long ago, that it would be coming. Now God says he will accept and acquit us. He will declare us not guilty if we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we can all be saved in the same way. Doesn't matter what my background is, what my language is, my race, my sex, my religion. It doesn't matter. We can all be saved in the same way by coming to Christ, no matter who we are or what we've been like. I like that. No matter who we are or what we've been like. You know, a lot of people have this little secret closet in their mind where they've got stored the worst thing or things that they've ever done. It's usually something that we regret deeply. Some are no doubt worse than what others have in their secret closet. And because it's the worst thing you've ever done, you tend to make it a part of you. And you feel like you can't let go of it. Why? Well, probably because your mind hasn't figured out yet a way for you to pay for it. You're still working out your own atonement. But whatever that thing is, it's been paid for by Jesus. Jesus already paid for it. He paid for that sin. You can be forgiven and you can be free of self-condemnation. You can stop nailing yourself to the cross because Jesus was nailed to the cross for you. Jesus was hung up for your hang-ups if you trust him to take away your sins. Titus 2, it says he gave himself for us to be to set us free from every sin to set us free from those things in our closet, to cleanse us, that we can be his special people, enthusiastic about good things. Every sin. There is no sin that is too big or too bad for God to forgive. He doesn't want you chained to your past. When you hold on to that thing or those things in your closet, you're saying that, you know what, Jesus, I appreciate what you did, but it just wasn't enough. You're basically saying, God, you know, you got it all wrong. Let me tell you how it works. This thing stays with me. I mean, that actually sounds a little ridiculous when you put it that way, doesn't it? But that is exactly what you're saying. You need to trust Jesus to take the fall for us, to save us from the penalty of our sins, to atone. And then the second thing we need to do is we need to be happy about it. You need to bask in it. You need to soak it in. I believe that God always wants us to remember what happened on the cross and what it cost. There's no question. It's one of the reasons Jesus implemented communion, so that we can remember. But I also know that God doesn't want us to remain there. Jesus' time didn't end on the cross. He didn't stay there. He went on to defeat death and was resurrected. Our story doesn't end at the cross. Don't end your story there. If your story and your relationship end there, then yeah, you've got salvation And you'll be with God and Jesus for eternity. But there's so much more to a relationship with Jesus. There's so much more in what he did by being resurrected. He didn't need to be resurrected resurrected in order to purchase our entry into paradise. Jesus was resurrected so we could have a full life here and now on earth. So he could display his power over death and in your life. So you could overcome the circumstances of your life, to give your life a purpose, to give you peace that passes understanding, that your joy may be full. The Bible says now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God. What's the new relationship with God? That I'm not at odds with him anymore. Because now in God's eye, 
All I am is someone who said yes to what Jesus did for me, who said, thank you for doing that. Because our Lord Jesus has made us friends of God. You're a friend of God. That should make you happy. You should rejoice in that. Not only is your relationship with God fixed, it's better than that. I mean, like, have you ever been with someone and someone famous comes up in conversation or on the movie or on the TV or you're watching something, right? And all of a sudden that person, you kind of see them getting a little inflated and they say, you know, yeah, Robert Downey, Iron Man, I know him. We were friends growing up. He's a friend of mine. Maybe I'll know, let you know when he comes around and we can kind of hang out. I can introduce you, right? It should be the same but better for our relationship with God. Like you can be like, yeah, you know that apple you're eating? I know the guy who made that. He's a friend of mine. Or see that sunset? I know the guy who set that up. Or that new baby you have over there? I know the guy who breathed life into her or him. Which leads us to the next thing we should respond with this. Tell someone. Tell other people. Yeah, that guy that made the ocean, he's a friend of mine. We should hang out together. Let me introduce you. I mean, if you understand everything that God did for us, why would you ever keep it a secret? Why would you keep Jesus a secret that you can be free from your guilty conscience, that you can have a life with purpose, that you can be a friend of God, the creator of the universe, that you can be free from your past, that the things that you feel have power over you don't need to, that you can have the best retirement plan there is for your life after now? And listen, I'm trying to be positive about this. I'm trying to keep you focused on all the great things of our faith that should make you want to share it. But there is a reality we need to accept of what's going on here. Your friend, your coworker, your neighbor, your family member. How is it any expression of love to be too worried about what they think of you, to be too worried about them thinking you're weird, to be too embarrassed about your relationship with Jesus, that you would be willing to let them spend an eternity in hell. You know, growing up in the church, I have several moments that I can po point to that are burned in my memory. They had such an effect on my thinking that 40 plus years later, they still come to mind. And sometimes I share them with you, and I'm going to share you another one. This is another one that I got from a speaker that was at a youth conference. And this is what they said. They said, imagine on that day of judgment, you get your judgment from God. It's not guilty. You're invited to enter paradise. And your friend or your coworker or your family member is there, and they get their judgment. And it's guilty. And then they get their sentence, an eternity in death. And before they're taken away, they look at you and they say, you knew? You, you knew about this? You knew this would happen and you never told me? You kept this to yourself? Why didn't you tell me? That has always been a sobering thought for me. And I don't know that it's going to play out like that, but I can imagine it. It's not up to you to make sure they say yes. We all get to decide for ourselves. It is your responsibility that they know there's a choice. It was all done for us. Jesus paid the price. He atoned for it all. That's good news. That's worth sharing. And if you've never trusted Jesus, you can do that today. I have no idea how people come to watching this live stream, but if you're here with us now, live, or later watching the recording, you can put your trust in him at this very moment. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you did on the cross for me. And God, I it is such good news to me, Lord God, that you don't abandon, that you didn't abandon Jesus, that you don't abandon me, that you've never abandoned me. Father, I just thank you for that. I thank you for always chasing me. I thank you always for pursuing me and wanting to be closer and, and wanting to spend eternity with me. Thank you that you know me. Father, thank you that you know each person who's praying with me this morning, Lord. You know their heart. You know what they want. You know their needs. You're chasing them as well. 
I invite you that if you've never accepted Jesus, that you can do that now. All you have to do is just agree with me. Lord God, I thank you for what Jesus did for me. I believe that he paid the price for me, that he atoned for my wrongs. Thank you for that. I want to know you more. I want to come to you. I don't want to have my back turned to you anymore. I want to turn to you, and I want to know you more. Remember me, Lord. If you prayed that, you're part of the family of God now. You're in. Your salvation is true. It's pure. It's set. You can know that you're going to be in heaven. And you can know that God doesn't abandon you. If you've responded in that way, again, there's an invitation in the comments to let me know so that I can pray for you and I can get you some more information. I pray that you'll do that. So now I want to just transition this into some discussion time. As you know, we encourage you to get together in a small group to watch this service with someone. And that may be a smash group, a Sunday morning at someone's home or with your family, or maybe you're just by yourself or just with your spouse. I just want to give you a chance to talk about what we just went over this morning and interact with it a little bit. If you're alone and you want to talk, there's a link in the comments to an online smash group. Eileen and Jill will be hosting that and leading that. They'll be talking about these questions. And here's the questions I'd like you to talk about today. The first is, Go ahead and read Matthew 27, 46 in as many versions as you have. Try to get some of the literal versions, like the New King James, Old King James, the New American Standard, the Amplified Version, some of the older texts, the literal translations. How does this change things for you to understand that God doesn't abandon Jesus on the cross? Second, I want you to read 2 Corinthians 5.21. And I want you to talk about what this verse is saying happened on the cross between you and Jesus, between us and Jesus. What does atonement mean for the sins of our past? And third, as always, I don't want you to forget to pray and minister to each other. It's such an important time of our groups. I love you guys. I can't wait to see you next week. Um... I hope you'll be there. I hope you make every effort to attend. So, Heavenly Father, I just bless your people now, Lord God. I bless them with the understanding of who you are, Lord God. I bless them with your presence, Father. May they know your presence all the time, everywhere they are, in every situation, Lord God. May you bless these conversations, Lord God. May your Holy Spirit speak to each person now here this morning. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I do love you guys. I can't wait to see you next week. I hope you can come out and be with us. Have some great discussions now, and I see. I will see you soon. God bless you.
said the 